Good morning. To Smyrna Church with love, Jesus said to them, don't fear guys, and you hold true to your convictions, to your faith. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've thoroughly enjoyed reading the book of Revelation as part of our daily readings for, for this month. In fact, I, I, what I had to do is I just read it through about three times from go to woe, had three commentaries and, and learnt some new things and ideas and, and uh, I was greatly encouraged. In fact, I, I lined up Cathy and I preached this message to her. I said, sweetheart, and she said, you're not going to say that, are you? I said, just listen, don't critique, just listen, be blessed, you know. And... <laughs> Look, the book of Revelation um, was written when Christians were entering a time of persecution by the Roman government under a terrible emperor or an evil man called Domitian. Some of the emperors were good, but some of them were real creeps, and this one was a bad one from about 81 to 96 AD. And uh, the Roman authorities were beginning to embrace the new cult of emperor worship that was around at the time of Julius Caesar, in fact, 44 BC when Julius Caesar was murdered and he basically recreated the, the Roman Empire in his own image, what he wanted it to become. And then his family, Augustus, right through to Nero for about 100 years became the rulers. But even he accepted when the, 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 the role or the title of being a living God. And so uh, he uh, kind of accepted it as part of the beginnings of a new kind of state religion, but it wasn't official as such. And so all the emperors were, were um, allowed it, but Domitian actually prescribed it. He actually said, this is now the law of the land. By 100, so it's about 150 years after it started, he's saying, you've got to do it. Um, and so um, in the provinces, it was, it was particularly um, rampant because a lot of the governors outside of Rome, right throughout the Roman Empire, were trying to carry favour with Rome. And so they were kind of like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into emperor worship, maybe we'll get some more funds, you know, and maybe we'll uh, get some more funds from the, from the, the government. Um, but, um, but Christians who held that Christ and not Caesar was Lord, they were facing a real dilemma and increasing hostility. And, and this was an era when the traditional Roman gods, the pantheon of gods that they had, were being discarded. And hundreds of cults from Persia, Mesopotamia, Egypt were flooding into the Roman Empire and, uh, and even into the capital itself. And so the Roman government, under Emperor Domitian, wanted to counter the threat to the social cohesion because people would believe anything. So some religious cult would come in and people would believe that and others would believe that. There were hundreds of them. And so uh, they feared the Roman Empire, if it didn't have a cultural social foundation of some belief system, would fall apart. And, and so uh, they felt emperor worship. So Domitian started enforcing it and to try and unify this rapidly expanding empire. So John writes Revelation the 22 chapters, basically to encourage and warn seven churches situated in Asia Minor, uh, which is on the coast of, of Turkey, uh, kind of in the middle of, of, of the Aegean area and uh, within a radius of around 50 or so miles. There's about 10 churches, Christian churches in, in Asia Minor, but he writes to seven of them about how to conduct themselves in this developing hostility regarding emperor worship and those who weren't going to comply. And so sadly, some of the churches were advocating a policy of compromise, saying, well, you can worship Jesus, but you can also worship Domitian. And, but Smyrna, as we shall see a little bit later, was not, one, was, was, um, was not prepared to compromise this, the people in Smyrna, at great cost to themselves because of the unique kind of culture that Smyrna had. The, the literary form that John used to write the book of, uh, of Revelation is called apocalyptic literature, which we don't really understand today. But it was popular for about 300 years, from 200 BC to about 100 AD. The, the made, one of the key ways by which you would write is use apocalyptic literature, but we, we don't actually 
use that now. It was very familiar to the Jews and very familiar to the first Christians, but not to us today. It's confusing for us when we read a book like Revelation, a bit like sections of Ezekiel, the sections of Daniel, um, because we try and read it literally. You know, one and one makes two. But apocalyptic literature, one and one makes three, or one and one makes five. And so it, it, it doesn't follow the normal sequential kind of literal understanding of, 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 of literature. And it's highly symbolic. It's a little like how John, when he writes his Gospel of John, how he uses some beautiful metaphors about Jesus. So he says Jesus is the Word becoming flesh. He says he's the light of the world. He is the bread of life. He is the water of life. He is the door by which you come through. He is the vine. He is the shepherd. So not literally, you can't say, well, he's literally a vine, but it's, it's descriptive language to help us understand something about his character. Well, apocalyptic literature is a little bit like this, but to the nth degree. It was veiled language. And in fact, it was very helpful to confuse those who were looking for excuse to persecute Christians because they would read it. And, uh, and so John's blowing raspberries at the emperor, but the Roman authorities are reading it and going, what does that mean? And so he's actually saying to them, he's the antichrist, he's the beast, you know, and, and kind of like, he's going to fall and Jesus is going to reign. But, but they're reading it and thinking, what the heck is he talking about? because they would prescribe certain literature that was against government policy. So it was very helpful in that era to write like that. For example, the stars, when you, when you read Revelation, stars, commentators say he's either referring to angels or they're actually messengers. And so they think he's referring at times to, to angels and other times to the ministers of the churches or to the, or to the head pastors, the head leaders of those local churches. Lampstands are local churches. Um, the great prostitute, this is a great term, the great prostitute, the harlot, like he really gets into, into kind of this, he's actually talking about Rome. He says, that Babylon. And so the people reading it think, Babylon, that's over in Mesopotamia. The Roman Empire ends there, Babylon's nothing now, but he's actually talking about Rome. He goes, the beast, you know, who, who, who strides the seven hills. Well, the seven hills are the seven hills of Rome. So it's all veiled language, so the Christians know what he's talking about, but the authorities didn't know. And, uh, uh, and the heavenly Jerusalem, for example, is the universal church. It's a city that comes down from heaven. Uh, horns, when you see, there's lots of horns, you know, beasts with horns and seven horns, ten horns, twenty horns, whatever. Well, a horn in the Old Testament... An animal horn is a sign of strength and power. It's a symbol. So they knew when he's talking about horns, powerful. Um, the number seven occurs something like 52 times. Now, some of you are going to go and read, read it and prove me wrong that it's 51 or 53. But it's around 52 times. And it's the symbol of completion. It's actually God's number, seven. So there are seven blessings or beatitudes. Seven churches, seven spirits, seven lampstands, seven stars, seven seals, seven horns and eyes. Seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven signs, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven bowls, seven hills, seven kings. And um, it's like, that's the number of perfection, it's God's number. And then, of course, the number for man is what? Six. So, you know, the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, you know, the Antichrist, the number is six, six, six. And people go, oh, you know, I wonder who the Antichrist is. I wonder who the beast is. You know, and, and uh, perhaps one day he's going to rise and we're all going to have 666 on our foreheads. Well, actually, John says here, he tells us in Revelation 38, it says, this calls for wisdom. He goes, look, you've got, you've, got, you've got to be wise here. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. That is the number 666. So what he's giving us, it actually, in Revelation, he tells us the keys to some of the some of the, the, the signs. And so 666 is basically saying that's the number of man. And so men, humanity can become beastly. And great evil can occur through men and women and governments and authorities when they exclude Jesus Christ from their life. That's what he's saying. So there's always been beasts. There's always been antichrist. He's basically saying humanity without Jesus has the propensity to do a lot of evil. So when you're reading the book of Revelation, now you've read up to chapter 10 if you're following the daily readings, you do another seven chapters this week, keep the three R's in mind when you're reading it. Firstly, respect the context. It's written for the first century church 
And it's addressed to their issues in their world, the world that they were living in. It was not written to us, actually. It was written to people living around 80, 90, 100 AD. However, it's relevant to all Christians, including ourselves. It's relevant to Christians in every generation, like the rest of the Bible. So there are some timeless, transferable truths that relate to us today, relate to you today, sitting here at the Christian Family Centre. Some of the things that I'm going to say is like, man, that's me. That's what I'm going through. Man, how did John know that? Because it's relevant. It's God's eternal word that relates to any generation, even ours. And, and thirdly, it's important to reject extreme views. Look, there's some weird and wacky views out there. You know, there's, there's the view of, of those who believe it's all to do with the future. So we call them futurists. And it's basically, they, they believe that except for the first three chapters, everything in the book of Revelation relates just before Jesus returns. Right? It's just like, it's all going to happen about three or four years or five years before Jesus comes. Then we're going to get snatched to heaven. And one theory says, well, then we're going to come back and, and then the rotters burn here on earth. It's, it's like... So the obvious question would have to be raised is why the heck would John write a, a book that ignores 1,800 years of real history if it just relates to the end of time? So, so it doesn't make sense to, to read it, to think it's all about the future. And then, of course, there's those who are more the historicists. And I used to be in this camp, confession to make here. And starting with the first century, they believe that the book of Revelation is being progressively fulfilled in historical periods till Jesus returns. So, you know, chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way through, you can track it through into Western European history, where the church was predominantly in that, in that era, and we're up to about chapter 17 now. But there's a problem there. It's a problem, because it's all about Western European history. What about Chinese history? What about Indian history? What about African history? What about American history? What about South American history? The rest of the world. <laughs> they just ignore it and, and are European-centric and not even Eastern Orthodox Church-centred. So, so really the historical view has great difficulties. Now, sadly, yes, I was a rabid historicist. Um, and our denominational family, CRC Church International, tended to be very historicist in their view, and they were very anti the futurist view. Uh, however, um, I had uh, have come to a different position now, and so the CRC as a movement doesn't really hold to a specific view of prophecy. Look, let me just give you an example. You know, in, in Ezekiel 20 and in Revelation 20, the, the, there's nations like Gog and Magog that are identified as saying these are antichrist beastly nations and they're going to war against Jesus and Armageddon's going to come and there's going to be hundreds of millions of people fighting, you know, and, and it's, it's really quite difficult to get your head around it. Well, believe it or not, I interpreted Gog and Magog up until 19, the mid-1980s as uh, the nations that embraced international communism headed by the Soviet Union. And uh, so if you know anything about 20th century history, the Soviet Union was formed out of 15 nations and they developed an ideology of international communism to take over the world. After the Second World War, they took over half of Europe. And so the Vietnam War, which I grew up in and, and just missed being called up, that was one of the fights between the West and, and between free enterprise and communism. So little Vietnam became the outpost where the Soviets and the, and the Chinese communists were being pushing in and, and the Americans and Australians, we went and fought there. We had 500 soldiers killed, thousands wounded. So, so this is not just theoretical. This is like people believe this. And so we all felt, man, Soviet, the Soviet Union and international communism, that's the beast, that's the Antichrist, that's the false prophet. We could read it in the book of Revelation. Well, then in 1985, along comes a man called Mikhail Gorbachev and a short, stubby little guy. He had a sort of a, a mark on his head. And when, I still remember when people said, oh, he's got this birthmark on his bald head. Could that be the mark of the beast? Could this be the man? Well, anyway, he was brought up in a Christian home. His mum was Russian Orthodox. His daughter is a born-again Christian. He allowed Christian broadcasting to come into the Soviet Union. Can you believe that? From the West. 
And so he introduced concepts like glasnost and perestroika, openness and freedom. Let's liberate the Communist Party and let's have free thinking. Well, by 1989, he freed Eastern Europe. The whole of Eastern Europe that was from Trieste, from the Baltic to the Adriatic, which was an iron curtain, as Churchill said. He freed those countries from Poland right through to, right down to, to Hungary. And then, in 1991, at the end, an amazing thing. He is president of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And in December 1991, he signs a bill puts it through the parliament to abolish his position and to dismantle communism and the Soviet Union. No one gives up power. He had more nuclear weapons than he could destroy the world 10 times over. And so Gorbachev will go down in history as one of the great leaders who, who saw, saw the light and realised that demagoguery and dictatorship and beastly practices are not going to work. And so by 1991, well actually late 1990s, 1980s, I'm thinking, you know what? My view of prophecy has been proven wrong. And I had to utter those three words that are so hard for us to utter. Do you want to say them with me? I was almost wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. Which then, of course, <laughs> I had to say, well, I've been wearing these glasses the historical view of prophecy, I had to get a new pair of glasses on to read the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and, and some of that apocalyptic literature. And so I remember reading Spurgeon, the great Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers in the 1800s, led the largest church in the world in London for 40-odd for, uh, um, years. He was the boy preacher. He started preaching when he was 16, led a great revival when he was 19, and he just is an amazing man. I remember reading one of his letters and he, he writes to fellow pastors and leaders and he goes, away with your Napoleonic speculations. Centre your thoughts on Jesus and how he enables you to live for him today and be empowered by his spirit to take his gospel to the four corners of the earth. Because there were people there in the 1860s, 1870s saying, oh, Napoleon's going to rise again. Maybe one of his kids and grandkids and there's going to be another Napoleonic era. Just like in the 20th century, Kaiser Wilhelm II, he was the beast. And then, of course, Hitler definitely was the beast, the Antichrist, and Mussolini was the false prophet. Tojo from, from the Empire of Japan, we don't know what he was, didn't quite fit in. And then of course communism had to be, hey, there are always beasts, there are always Antichrists, there are always false prophets, there are always those who oppose decency and order and goodness and humanity, and who just enter into power and abuse, and history's full of it. And so I had to change my my thinking, and um, to come to a different position, and that's what I'm sharing with you today. So uh, I developed a new respect for the context principle, whom John was writing to, those seven churches. Had to think about those seven churches. And then the rest of the, the chapters, chapters 4 to 22, really are for the, the, the seven churches to understand who Jesus is and what he's done and what he's going to do. I developed a new conviction of its relevancy, the book of Revelation, to all Christians in every generation. I saw its relevancy to the first century and to the 20th century and the 21st and the 6th and the 7th. As you read it, it's a book of tremendous hope in spite of evil that might abound in our world. So there are four timeless truths when interpreting Revelation. If you want to interpret Revelation, there are four truths that you need to keep in mind. The first one is it must, it must be Scripture that interprets Scripture. Not man-made theories about when and how Jesus will return to wrap everything up. It's not proof reading, kind of, or proof texting. In other words, you read, you're reading into Scripture your own predetermined views. Like I had a set of glasses on, and so as I was reading the Scripture, I'm reading it with a bias that I'm thinking it's just reinforcing a, a position I already had, rather than letting Scripture itself explain itself, to allow the whole Bible to throw light upon an important subject. Secondly, it must be Jesus-centred. In other words, it needs to magnify the cross of Christ and the resurrection and the victory of Jesus, because that's the big theme of the Bible. Now, the book of Revelation can't be 
interpreted without the use of the other scriptures. The book of Revelation has to be centered on Jesus because the whole Old Testament points to the coming of the promised Messiah. And the whole New Testament proclaims and explains the wondrous salvation that God now accomplishes for us through the cross and the resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Have a read of Revelation 12, says this, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Old Testament pointed to the coming of Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, accuser means slanderer, deceiver, that's the devil, He has been hurled down. They triumphed over the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So here you see the victory of Christ. And that's just one statement in Revelation, but there are heaps of them. Thirdly, it must build my faith in Jesus and not instill fear regarding evil and Satan. And uh, folks, Christ will be victorious. We're on the winning side. Have a read of this. Revelation 11, 15 tells us the ending. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Hey, we know the end of the story. Christ has won, will win, and his victory becomes our victory. So any view of Revelation that instills fear and somehow magnifies the power of man and the devil is not sound. Because the book of Revelation magnifies the power of Jesus and his amazing victory, what he accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection on our behalf. And then fourthly, it must empower my witness of Jesus and not evoke an escapist, heartless attitude towards lost people. That's where the futurist view is so faulty because the futurist view says, oh, it all relates to the last few years and then we get secretly raptured to heaven, the rest burn, then we come back and there's another judgment. thinking, well... You mean 1,800 years we ignore and then somehow the whole thing is to to an escapist mentality, hold the fort till Jesus comes. That's not what Revelation says. Revelation says, go forward, push back the barriers of evil. Christ has won the victory. Yes, he will return. You don't know when, but now it's the time to spread the message and to be a testimony of who Jesus is to a broken and lost world. And we love the people of the world. We don't hate them. It's a gospel of love, and so it's not an escapist mentality. So Revelation 19.10 says, I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. I love this. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. So he's actually saying, what I'm writing is to help you in your witnessing. It's a testimony about Jesus Christ. So interestingly... There are 19 names for Jesus in the book of Revelation. Like, not just one, not just two, 19 different names. Because with Jesus, there's no end, only hopeful new beginnings. And when you compare, for example, the first book of the Bible, Genesis, with the last book of the Bible, you see an amazing contrast. Let me just give you a, a couple of things here. But like in Genesis, the sun is created. In Revelation, the sun is not needed. When the new heavens and the new earth is recreated. Satan's victorious in Genesis, Satan's defeated in Revelation. Sin, sickness, suffering enters the human experience in Genesis, but sin, sickness and suffering is banished through the message of Revelation. People run and hide from God in Genesis, but people are invited to life with God forever in Revelation. People are cursed in Genesis, but the curse is removed in Revelation. Tears are shed with sorrow for sin, but no more sin, no more tears or sorrow is the story of Revelation. The created garden and earth are cursed, but God's city is perfect. The earth is made new. The fruit from the tree of life is not to be eaten in Genesis, but in Revelation we're told God's people are free to eat of the tree of life. Paradise is lost, paradise is restored. People are doomed to eternal death and separation from God, but in Revelation death is defeated. Believers live forever with Jesus. Isn't that fantastic? That is fantastic. Read Genesis, read Revelation, and you realise, man, we see how sin came in, sickness, darkness. Now we see what's going to happen ultimately. It's a book of tremendous hope and encouragement. The entire book of Revelation tells us certain things. And you may be going through some tough times because the people of Smyrna, and we'll read just what Jesus specifically said to them, they were going through a really hard time. Vicious 
attacks on their person. Slander that would cut to their hearts. And, and if you've been slandered by somebody, and I have been slandered, and uh, there's, there's nothing worse than to, to bear false testimony and somebody slanders you, and it's nothing to do with what you said or what you did, but they've created another story to present you in a particular light. It's really terrible. You just think, ah, that is just such an evil thing. That's why this, the, one of the Ten Commandments is not to bear false testimony. These Smyrnians were being slandered. They were going through terrible persecution. Their property was being attacked and pillaged. And, uh, and, and Jesus says, yep, it's, you're going through a tough time. It's, it, it's going to happen. And he gives them encouragement in it. But you know, the, the entire book of Revelation tells us that Christ is absolutely sovereign. Jesus, the humble, suffering, servant, saviour, is the all-powerful, conquering king and judge. The whole of history is under the control of God, not the devil and not evil people. Have a look at Revelation 5. Now, I've got to read this because you read it this week, but it's a long passage, but I think it helps you see what John is saying and the kind of language he uses. He says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the victor, the king of the animal world, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then he goes in and goes, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Lion, lamb imagery, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures that he talks about in chapter 4, and the elders... Now notice this, the lamb had seven horns, not the beast, you know, many big horns and little horns, all that stuff, and seven eyes, which are the sevenfold spirit of God sent into all the earth. Notice the number seven, what did I say before? Perfection, God's number. He said, here's the lion, the king. A victor, but now there's a lamb. And, and, and I see he's, he's been slain. But as he sees him, you know what he says? He says, it's Jesus. He's got seven horns. In other words, he is all powerful. A horn is a symbol of strength and power. Seven's the number of perfection. He is all powerful. And he's got seven eyes. He's not only all powerful, he is all seeing. He sees everything. He is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he sees everything. And then the sevenfold spirit of God sent out into all the earth. It's not like God's got seven spirits, it's just language to help us understand perfection. God is everywhere. In other words, Jesus is omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. He is here among us. He is with the Smyrnians. He is with the Romans. He is with every, he's everywhere. The resurrected Christ is in heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit and he is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is everywhere at the same time. And this is a hopeful statement that he's giving to them. But when you initially read it, you think, what the heck is he talking about? So you understand what the symbols mean. It says, and he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. I love this. They just fall down. They want to worship Jesus. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls of, full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Look among us here, 50 different nations represented in one church. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests, to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Hey, is this political reign? Is this military reign? No, Jesus' victory is now our victory and we reign with him in his kingdom of selfless love and goodness. And he wants that kingdom of selfless love and goodness to permeate this evil, selfish world that we're in. That's what he's saying. Until he comes, then he's going to wrap everything up. No one and nothing can withstand Jesus. That's what, that's what he's saying here. Nobody can withstand him. 
He is absolutely sovereign. He is for us. He is with us. He lives in us through the Holy Spirit. We are saved and made safe and made secure through Christ. Look at all human history. All megalomaniacs are overthrown. If there's anything about history, it's all the bad guys bite the dust. All the arrogantly prideful crash and burn. And we end up hating them. Does anybody love Hitler? Does anyone love Stalin? They're hated. Pol Pot, Saddam Hussein. Who do we love? We love the humble. We love the merciful. We love the people who are good. Because, and, and so, so all, all history is under God's control. And all Christ dishonoring ideas will be found to be hollow as only Christ can truly satisfy the human heart that yearns for meaning, peace, and purpose. He is sovereign over your life. He was sovereign over the Smyrnians' life. Secondly, Christ will definitely return. He will definitely return. Revelation 3 says this beautifully. I love, I love this. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. It's a warning to anyone who is apathetic. We don't know when he's going to come back. We don't know the hour, we don't know the day. But you've got to live your life as if he could come back today. And he said that to, to these Christians in the seven churches. It's a warning to anyone who's apathetic. So we've got to root out any sin that blocks our relationship with Jesus. And like Jesus' word to the Ephesian church, which we talked about last week, we've got to get back to our first love and develop real intimacy with Jesus. Thirdly, the message that we see here is that our faithfulness to Christ will be rewarded. It will be rewarded. To the church of Smyrna, Jesus says this, be faithful, guys, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. It's such an encouraging book to those who are faithful and persevere to the end. Some of you have been serving the Lord for decades. I've been 45 years serving him. Who's longer than me? Who's been serving the Lord longer than 45 years? Lift your hands up. Be, don't be bashful. Come on. Lift your hands up. You've been, you've been serving the Lord longer than 45 years. Do you know what he's saying here to you? He, he is saying that I notice you. Even though others may not notice you, I see your faithfulness. I see your servant's heart. I see how oriented you are to loving Jesus and serving people. And even in the bad times, in the difficult times, you're still doing it. And he says, you're going to be rewarded. You're going to be rewarded for your faithfulness. And then he says that perfect justice will come. I love this one. These wonderful statements. Perfect justice is actually going to come one day. We live in a world of imperfect justice. I love our Western, particularly Australian, principles of common law, the rule of law, and in the United States and Western Europe. But you know, even the best legal system can make terrible mistakes. I was just reading the other day of a man who spent 33 years in prison in the United States for a crime he didn't commit. They said he was a Navy, Navy boy, late 20s. They say he raped and murdered a girl. But it was the guy, another guy in the, in the same ship that was on furlough that did it. But there was a corrupt cop, corrupt prosecutors, and they stacked it. And the man spent 33 years in jail. Thankfully, they had some materials that they did some genetic testing. And he's actually proven that it's not him, but the other guy who's now dead. He got away with murder, rape and murder. And this guy's in prison for 33 years. And when you hear him talk, and he bursts into tears when he talks about his mum and dad, he says, it killed my parents. Because my dad was never the same man after that. And he goes, this is the saddest thing. He goes, I, 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 I can't see my parents. And you feel like screaming. You think there's got to be a day where there's perfect justice. And this is in our systems, which are pretty good. What about the systems of the world where injustice occurs? And rampant injustice. Right now, the Prime Minister of, of Malaysia is being investigated because they reckon he's, he's nicked about a billion dollars. And he still reckons he hasn't done nothing wrong. <laughs> and our ANZ bank knows about it because they own a bank in, in Malaysia and they can't get rid of him. And the ex-Prime Minister Mahathir says, come on, nations of the world, put the pressure on him. He's a first-class crook. We sack our MPs if they spend 300 bucks over and above their allotted 
things for, for, for doing stuff. These guys, they steal hundreds of millions. And you think, man, there's injustice. And then you think of all the evil. Child abuse. Slavery, murder, rape, killings, what's going on throughout our world. And something within us says there's got to be a day of justice. Well, there is, and the book of Revelation tells us this. Revelation 12, 11 to 10, sorry, Revelation 20, 11 to 12 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who's, who's seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. No one can escape. And I saw the dead, great and small, great and small. Presidents, prime ministers, military leaders and small, standing before the throne and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Man, I don't want to be part of that. I don't, I don't want to be part of that. You know what? And in Revelation 22, he says this, Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. In other words, eternal life, the heavenly Jerusalem. Only Christians who have renounced sin as a way of life and have turned to Christ and have asked for his forgiveness and received his mercy can be saved for eternity. And we don't, we're not harsh towards those who have not come to Christ. Our appeal is, in fact, in some respects, we say, Jesus, don't come back yet because there are still too many people to get saved. The true Christian says, you know what? We've got to reach lost people. The children, the men, the women, the world needs Christ. So rather than having an escapist mentality saying, oh, Jesus, come because I've got some issues and problems, we need to be empowered to take the gospel to the four, nation, to, to, to the four corners of the earth. And so we need people whose robes are washed by Jesus and who are definitely saved. If you're here today... I'm telling you the truth. You will face the judgment seat of Christ one day. And it's up to you whether you're going to face him in the great white throne when the books are opened up and everything's disclosed or whether he's going to say, come on, receive grace now, be forgiven. You come through this door into the door of eternal life. You're not going to be judged as for your sins. You're going to be judged on how faithful you've been with the grace that I've given to you, what you've done with the gift of salvation. Evil wins some battles, but God wins the war, folks. Human justice has limitations and is not perfect, but not so with Jesus when he returns. In Revelation, we keep seeing Jesus as both lamb and lion, saviour and lord, servant and king. Revelation paints the picture that it's the slain lamb who is triumphant. What a wonderful image, a slain lamb who is triumphant. It presents a theology of power exercised in love. It's like all-powerful Jesus, but he's exercising that power through love, the force of love, to win people over, not by the force of law and sanction, but by the power of our witness of who he is and to melt people's hearts that they willingly will submit to him. It's a beautiful picture. And finally, he says that we would never lose hope. Heaven in the book of Revelation is not some never, never land of fancy. You know, we die and we, like the Middle Ages, they had us going to heaven and we become little fat angels sitting on a cloud playing a harp. I mean, that's just stupid. It's not the never, never land of fancy, but the ever, ever land of God's eternal presence and his values and his judgment. In Revelation 3, 5, it says, the one who overcomes will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Oh, isn't that great? Particularly when facing tough times and life becomes difficult and our faith in Jesus is being tested. This is hard when we believe that God is sovereign and active in the world. I find it hard because I believe God is sovereign and active in our world. And yet when I see that I go through tough times or other people do, and it doesn't seem like anything's happening, it requires that I have strong faith to be able to perceive this. All 22 chapters of Revelation give this picture. And it was so encouraging and helpful to the churches of Asia Minor. He encouraged them, he helped them, he corrected them, he restored them. Let me read what he says to the church of Smyrna as I bring my message to a conclusion and we have some prayer together. And they're facing terrible issues. 
He doesn't correct them like he does to the Ephesians, because the Ephesians, he, he, he commends them, then he corrects them. These guys had no significant flaws. His heart goes out to them, and he says this, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? And it's interesting, because these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again, because the Smyrnians were so in love with their city. That city had actually died. It was burnt to the ground, and for 300 years, it was a ruin. And then it was brought back to life, and they made it a brand new city with wide boulevards. It was beautiful. They reckon it was one of the prettiest cities in the world. And they were always talking about what they were and who they now are. Interesting. And he says, hey, this, and it became a large trading port city. And, uh, and they were kept on focusing how different they were to the old city. And Smyrna, in fact, in, again, from my research, they were one of the earliest towns to embrace emperor worship. Way back when Tiberius was emperor, he was the second emperor after Augustus. And, and so they had a competition, because it wasn't enforced, they had a competition of which city could build a temple for Tiberius, and Smyrna won it. So they were in an emperor worship in a big way. They really wanted to curry favour with the Romans. And even before Rome was the official authority in that region of Asia Minor, before it became a province, they were into Rome in a big way. Loyalty to Rome was number one value to the Smyrnians. And this is why Jesus then says, okay, you guys, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. He goes, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you were rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are, but are of the synagogue of Satan. In other words, he's saying, I know you're in serious trouble and the burdens that you're facing are crushing you. The poverty was extreme because what was happening was certain Jews, not all the Jews of Smyrna, certain Jews were ganging up and actually pillaging the Christians. And the Christians couldn't do anything because if they complained to the authorities, emperor worship was becoming legal, then the authorities would know, hey, there's a Christian church here. And so that these guys could do what they wanted. They could rape, they could kill, they could pillage, and the poor Christians there could not do anything to appeal to the magistrates and the Roman authorities because a Domitian had made it now prescribed that emperor worship was to be number one. And of course, these Christians would have to then bow the knee to Caesar and they wouldn't and they would be executed. So they were trapped. Terrible afflictions, terrible poverty, terrible slander, the things that they were saying to them. And, uh, and then he says, yet you are rich. <laughs> wow. Yet you are rich. In spite of their affliction, in spite of their poverty, you're rich. Our spiritual riches, folks, has nothing to do with the world's wealth and approval. Has nothing to do with it. We are rich beyond measure. Jesus is saying to them, guys, don't look at what you don't have. Look at what you have. This is what real life is about. Start thinking and reflecting about who you now are in me. And he goes, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Interesting. He actually says here, he's saying to us that suffering is part of life. Nowhere does the New Testament promise automatic immunity from suffering because you become a Christian. Nowhere. And anyone who teaches that, that you become a Christian, everything will go hunky-dory, is a liar. And it's not in Scripture and will deceive you and it'll undermine your faith when tough times come. Because I can tell you, I could sit down here for several hours and tell you the tough times that I've had in life. Married life, family life, extended family, difficulties, pressures, problems, and that sometimes afflictions that come your way. When a child gets sick for 12 years, 12 years in and out of the hospitals, in and out of the hospitals, every day praying for the first year, and the, the, the ironic thing was, as I'm praying for this little girl who's five, bleeding internally all the time, it took her 12 months to find out what's wrong with her. At that time, I had more people healed through my own personal ministry than any other time. It was weird. Non-Christians are coming in and getting saved and healed. I didn't even know them. I didn't even love them. They're strangers to me. 
I love my daughter, flesh of my flesh. I didn't know these people. I had to love them in Jesus' name. You know what I mean, but I didn't know them. And they're coming, they're getting healed and touched. I'm thinking, and I'm praying every day in the spirit for her and it seemed like she's getting worse. That tests your faith to perceive the sovereignty and the goodness of God. Now she's a 30-year-old, wonderful woman, healed and going on with God and, and, and uh, serving him in amazing ways. But life can be a stinker at times. It can be really hard. And if anyone says, because you're a Christian, it's all going to go well, that's not true. And it'll undermine your faith and you'll you, you leave the, the kingdom because you're under a false premise. Just look at the Middle East right now. Just look at parts of Northern Africa, look at Pakistan, look at some of these countries of what's happening to Christians. They're trying to exterminate them. Mind you, they're trying to exterminate particularly the Islamist fascists. They're trying to exterminate any form of Islam as well. It doesn't compete with theirs. So they've probably killed more Muslims than they've killed Christians. So we need to keep that in balance. But they're, they're certainly targeting all Christians and churches to eliminate them from the Middle East. And he says here... <laughs> I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Wow. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. I thought, well, 10 days? What's this 10 days business? <laughs> What's that about? It's like, and then I, I understood what he's saying. God works out his good purposes in spite of the devil and evil people. And this testing time will come to an end. 10 days. It only has a limited time. God will have the last word, not the devil. Evil men won't win. The devil won't win. There's difficulties for a season, but God will always break through. And he says, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. In spite of the terrible hardships, we are optimistic. We're not pessimists. We win in the end and it's an eternal end. Life forever and ever and ever with Jesus. And when you're in your mid-60s or in, in your early 60s, those of you who are young say, ah, it's a long way away. I'm telling you, you just turn around, you're in your 20s and then you're in your 60s and it dawns on you that you've got far fewer years left than you had before and you might think, oh, you old fuddy-duddy, you're talking about death too much. Well, because I know it's coming closer for me than for those of you that are young but I have no fear of it because I know exactly where I'm going. I'm assured of that. I'm going to live forever and ever and ever with Jesus Christ. And when he returns, he's going to wrap everything up. New heavens and new earth. And he says this. Yeah, you can give the Lord a clap. Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand together. Let's stand and muse as you come up and, and we're going to sing a, a, beautiful, a beautiful song. He says, I'm going to give you the victor's crown. It's interesting. He uses the word Stephanie. Ha, ha, the name of my first daughter. Stephanos. Not the Adama, not a worldly crown. It is a wreath, a garland that they gave to Olympians, to athletes. Smyrna was a great athletic city. They loved their games. And he says, you know what? We're going to give you, you're going to be, everyone's going to cheer you. Everyone in heaven, the angels, the witnesses. Because you're a winner. He goes, I'm going to give you the victor's crown. And he says, whoever has ears... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the Christian Family Center. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. The future belongs to Jesus Christ and to no one else. If you are born only once, you will die twice. But if you're born twice, natural birth and spiritual rebirth, you will only die once. Our bodies will die one day, but never our souls. They will live forever and ever with Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? 